My name is Don Mercer, and in this video we will look at various types of dryers. Financial support for production of this series of video presentations was provided by the Széchenyi Society, founders of the Hungarian programs at the University of Toronto. The Széchenyi Society sponsorship is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Dr. Leventi Diashadi professional engineer and fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology who is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Diashadi's considerable efforts in coordinating this project are greatly appreciated. The material in these video presentations is based on an e-book published in November of 2014. Its title is An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables. It is available on the International Union of Food Science and Technology website, which can be accessed at www.iafost.org. We will begin with a brief introduction. Following this, we will look at methods of heat delivery and methods of operation for various dryers. We'll look at continuous dryers, tunnel dryers, cabinet dryers, tray dryers, fluidized bed dryers, vibrating bed dryers, spray dryers, and drum dryers. We will also look at some other types of dryers, and then we will examine solar dryers in a bit more detail, as well as taking a look at osmotic dehydration. Then we will finish up with some summary comments. Not all drying tasks are the same. Not all materials behave in the same manner when they are being dried. Tomatoes behave quite differently than mangoes in the same drying conditions. Different types of dryers or dryer designs are required for different tasks. We will now look at several different types of dryers used in the food industry. Dryers can be divided into two groups based on the methods in which heat is delivered to the material being dried. There are also ways of removing moisture without the application of heat and we will cover some of these at the end of this presentation. With the direct application of heat, the material is usually dried directly over the heat source. Drying material over a fire is probably the best example. With indirect applications of heat, the material is dried using air that has been previously heated by contact with the heat source. A hair dryer is a good example of this. The air is heated by passing it through a series of heating coils before it is blown onto your hair to dry it. Most dryers use the indirect heating method. The indirect application of heat offers better control over the drying process than can be achieved with direct heating. The following can be controlled. The temperature of the air, the velocity of the air, and the direction of the air. And in some cases, factors such as humidity can also be controlled. Another method of classifying dryers is by the manner in which they function. Batch dryers are used to process individual batches of material which are placed in the dryer and stay there until they reach the desired final moisture and are removed. Continuous dryers, on the other hand, work with raw materials being fed into one end of the dryer on a continuous basis. Dried product comes out the other end of the dryer also on a continuous basis. This requires the use of some means of conveying the material through the dryer. Continuous dryers are used in large-scale drying operations. They are generally costly and require a large facility to house them plus a crew of operators to run them. Batch dryers are used in small-scale drying operation and for specialized applications. No generalization can be made as to their cost and to their complexity, but for most small-scale drying operations, batch drying is the most appropriate mode of operation. 
Now let's take a look at continuous dryers. For solid materials, the material is fed onto a wire mesh conveyor belt that moves this material through the drying chamber and discharges it at the other end. For slurries or solutions, material is pumped into the drying chamber through a spray nozzle assembly into hot air and the dried product is separated from the hot air stream that conveys it. For now, we will focus on the continuous through circulation dryer. We will use a series of diagrams to explain their operation. A full description is available online in the ebook, An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables, which was mentioned previously. Here is the basic design of a through circulation dryer. Wet food material is placed on the beginning of a conveyor belt which then puts it through a drying chamber. Heated air which has a low water content then goes up through the drying bed and leaves as moist exhaust air. The dry food material is then discharged from the end of the conveyor belt as additional wet feed material is placed on the feed end of the belt. In this diagram we have a multiple zone dryer. We have zones 1, 2, 3, and 4. In the first zone we have updraft air which is traveling from the bottom of the dryer up through the bed essentially to dry the bottom surface of the bed so that when the product enters the second zone which is a downdraft zone it is actually not mashed into the dryer belt. A downward flow of air is used in the second zone to dry the top portion of the bed which may be slightly more damp than the bottom portion of the bed after leaving zone number one. In zone number three we have updraft. The air is once again traveling up through the drying bed and in zone four we have downdraft where we're actually using cool air to cool the material down before it is discharged from the end of the dryer. Hot material leaving the end of the dryer quite frequently picks up moisture from the air as it cools and we don't want this to happen. Air distribution is another consideration. Every effort must be taken to create an even distribution of air over the entire area of the material being dried. Uneven distribution of air creates a lack of uniformity in the moisture of the dried product that is leaving the dryer. Air distribution plates create uniform distribution of air, as their name implies. Without them, airflow patterns can be chaotic. Positioning of the distribution plates is important, as we shall see in a moment. Air distribution plates are basically sheets of metal with holes drilled in them at regular spacings. When placed in the air streams entering a dryer, the air distribution plates create a back pressure. Each hole then acts as a nozzle through which air is blown to contact the material being dried. Here we see the positioning of air distribution plates in an updraft zone. The air is entering the dryer from the bottom and before it hits the product bed it goes through the many holes of the air distribution plate which evens out the air flow and creates a uniform distribution across the entire dryer bed which in turn creates a uniform drying environment. In a downdraft zone there are sometimes two sets of air distribution plates. Here we see that they are positioned upstream of the product bed so that the air has to blow through them before it contacts the material being dried. In this way we also get a uniform distribution of air traveling in the downward direction. There are many other operational features of continuous through circulation dryers or conveyor belt dryers. However, we will not go into them here. Let's take a look at tunnel dryers. These are really a semi-continuous type of dryer. Material is placed on trays, screens, or wire racks which are slid into carts. The carts are pulled through a long drying tunnel where heated air blows across the product. Here we see a diagram of a tunnel dryer. 
The carts enter the dryer through a door on the left. The carts containing trays of material being dried are pulled through the dryer and once they reach the far end of the dryer on the right, they exit through the door that's there. You will also notice that the direction of airflow is opposite or counter to the direction the carts are traveling. So this is called counter current airflow. Cabinet dryers are truly a batch dryer. The essential design involves placing the material to be dried inside a closed chamber and blowing heated air across it. There are numerous control features which allow for air recirculation and other factors. Here we see a diagram of a typical cabinet dryer. Down in the bottom left hand corner we have the fresh air intake where the air enters the insulated cabinet. A damper controls the amount of fresh air that is allowed into the dryer. The inlet air then travels across a number of heating coils and these are on the suction side of the fan which is item number four in the diagram. The air is then pushed by the fan upwards through these louvers or the air distribution plate to ensure even distribution of airflow across the product that is being dried. In some cases we may have a filter ahead of the material being dried to remove particulate matter or to even act as an air distribution plate. The material being dried in this diagram is placed on three trays which are in line with the air coming in through the air distribution plates and filter material. So the warm air traveling across this material picks up moisture before it exits the dryer through the exhaust stack number eight. And there's also a damper here that can control the balance of air being exhausted and that will allow for a certain degree of potential recirculation of air down here at point number nine. And as already mentioned, this is all taking place in an insulated cabinet. A complete legend of these numbers appears in the next slide. So here is a legend of the numbers on the diagram for the cabinet dryer. Tray dryers are the most appropriate type of dryer for most of us. You may think of this as a simplification of the cabinet dryer design with very few fundamental differences. There can be numerous variations in the design of tray dryers. Here's a basic tray dryer design. Essentially what happens is that heated air enters the dryer and travels through an air distribution plenum. It then goes through an air distribution plate which makes sure that we have uniform air distribution across the material that is being dried in the insulated drying compartment. There may be another air distribution plate at the other end of the dryer so that we maintain an even flow of air into the plenum as the air discharges through the exhaust stack. Tray dryers are commonly used for home dehydration processes. The Nesco dryer is based on these principles. The Excalibur dryers also have the same basic design and are quite popular for home food dehydration. Let's take a look at another type of dryer which is a fluidized bed dryer. In these dryers hot air is blown up through the material to lift it and keep the particles suspended. This permits good contact between the drying air and the particles. It also prevents the particles from sticking together as they dry. A coffee bean roaster uses this principle as it roasts and dries the beans. Here are the green coffee beans in the roaster with no air flow. Here we see the fluidized bed with the heated air flowing. Notice how the beans are lifted by the air to form a fluidized bed that is continuously moving around in the moving air as they dry and roast. So basically what we have is an upward flow of hot air that lifts the beans and when they get to the top they are tossed to the outside. They then travel downwards and come back up the center so what we end up with is a continuous 
circulating pattern of beans going up through the middle and down the sides and continuously being suspended in this hot drying air. In vibrating bed dryers, we have a bed that is mounted on an oscillating device that makes the bed bounce up and down. Air comes into the dryer through the bottom of the bed. The material is tossed upwards and pitched forward in the dryer. It's rather difficult to do a good schematic diagram of this. However, you can see that there is a mechanism to vibrate the drying bed and the air comes up through the bottom and goes upwards through the bed and the product is thrown up into the drying air and moved ahead towards the product discharge. The exhaust air vents through the top of the dryer housing. Spray dryers allow particles in solution to be dried to form powders. These are very useful for spray dried powders in the dairy industry as well as in the pharmaceutical industry. The liquid is sprayed through an atomizing nozzle to create small droplets. The small droplets then enter a chamber where hot air is flowing. As the droplets fall, they lose moisture and form a powder. The powder is then collected. Here is a schematic diagram of a spray dryer. We see the liquid feed coming in at the top left of the diagram. It is then atomized through an atomizing nozzle and the spray is introduced into the drying chamber. Meanwhile, we have hot inlet air going into the drying chamber and in this case it is traveling upwards and counter to the direction of the falling liquid droplets. The dried particles then leave the dryer through the bottom and the exhaust air leaves through the top. Any particles of material that are carried out in the exhaust air are also separated and recovered. Drum dryers consist of two counter-rotating drums that pinch the material which then sticks to the heated surfaces. A doctor blade scrapes the dried material off the heated drums once the moisture has been removed. One or both of the drums may be heated. They can be used to produce products like dried potato flakes. In this diagram we see wet feed being introduced between two rotating drums. It then goes into the adjustable nip between the two counter rotating drums where it is pinched and sticks to the surface of the drums. In this case both drums are heated and you can see how the material would stick to it. The material then travels on the drum around until it gets to the position where a doctor blade scrapes the material from the heated drum and allows it to fall into a product collection receptacle. Wet material is continuously placed into the nip and the process continues. There are other types of dryers as well and time does not permit us to cover them in any great detail. We have freeze dryers, flash dryers, plate dryers, rotary dryers, vacuum dryers, rotolover dryers, and solar dryers but I would like to mention some of the operating features of solar dryers right now. Solar dryers are popular in light of rising energy costs. They use heat from the sun to warm the air which then flows across the surface of the food that is being dried. They are highly dependent upon weather conditions and they may take excessively long times to dry the product. Solar dryers can be used as a first step in drying when combined with another dryer as a second step. The solar dryer will remove moisture from the surfaces early in the drying process which is more rapid than moisture removal later. So the solar dryer can do the initial heavy lifting work. We should be using caution in solar drying various products. It may take several days to dry products with a solar dryer. During this time, microorganisms may proliferate, and this is especially important with foods for human consumption. Here we see a solar dryer which I built and worked with in our backyard. Air enters through the heat collector 
and as it travels upwards, the black metal surface, which is very hot, warms the air. This heated air then travels into the chamber of the solar dryer, and as you can see here, there are slices of mangoes in the drying chamber suspended on a metal rack. As the air travels across the material or through the drying bed, it removes moisture. The heated air is forced out of the drying chamber by these solar fans. Some dryers use only natural recirculation and convention and so do not have the high level of airflow that can be created by using these solar powered fans. Here's a solar flex dryer from Malnutrition Matters. In this case, air enters at the top right of the photograph and travels through this heat collector and moves across from the right to the left. The heated air then travels down through a plenum into the drying chamber, which is the black box underneath the heat collector. As the heated air travels through the box, it passes across the surface of the material being dried. And here, there are four electrical fans, which are powered by solar energy. After passing through the chamber where the material is housed, the exhaust air leaves at the bottom right. Osmotic dehydration is another interesting type of water removal system. Moisture can be removed by the forces of osmotic pressure, drawing moisture out of the tissues of the fruit or vegetables. This is often done using sugar or salt. Sugar can be in the form of a concentrated solution, usually 50% to 60% by weight. Solutions may be heated to about 50 degrees to speed the process, and this is different than using hot air to evaporate moisture. In this case, heating speeds diffusion of moisture. Here we see some cranberries in a sucrose solution, going through the process of osmotic dehydration. We can also use crystalline sugar or crystalline salt for osmotic dehydration. This technique has been used for many years to dry fish. In our example, we will use carrots instead of fish. Carrots are being covered with dry salt crystals which will draw moisture from the carrot tissue. Here you see the carrots being covered with salt crystals. And as we scrape the salt away, you can see how it's caking due to the moisture removal from the carrots. Salt is taken into the plant tissue during this process and the material may need to be soaked before using it to reduce the salt content which is typical with salted fish. Salt intake is an important dietary consideration, so you need to think carefully about this. Crystalline sugar, table sugar or sucrose, has some interesting applications in osmotic dehydration. We saw cranberries in a concentrated sucrose solution in a previous slide. This approach that we are going to show now avoids the use of a solution. We will use examples of apples and mangoes. For apples, we're going to place several slices of apples which have been previously weighed in a sealed container. This will work even if the slices overlap. So here we see the fresh apple slices in the container. Then we're going to weigh some sugar crystals in a container so that the weight is about 50 to 100 percent of the weight of the apple slices. The sucrose crystals are then going to be evenly spread over the apple slices and the container will be sealed. Here you see the sugar crystals on the apple slices. We're going to set the container aside for 12 to 24 hours and then observe what has happened. This can be done at room temperature quite effectively. After 24 hours of exposure to the sugar, we see that most of the sugar crystals have dissolved and what we have left is a concentrated sugar solution that has been created by the removal of moisture from the apple slices. And it's only in the top left hand corner of the container that you see a small amount of sugar that's left where it was just a little bit deeper than it was through the rest of the container. And you note that the syrup has been formed 
due to the removal of water from the apple slices. For mangoes, we can repeat the same process that we used for apple slices. Here we see mango slices in the container covered with table sugar or sucrose crystals. After 24 hours exposure to the sugar, we now see that there is a sugar solution on the bottom of the container that was created when the water was removed from the tissues of the mango. The partially dried apple slices or mango slices can then be drained or rinsed and blotted dry. They can then be dried in a conventional tray, forced air dryer to get the desired final moisture content. There may be an uptake of some sugar which sweetens the final product. These dried mango slices were probably dehydrated osmotically and then dried in a forced air dryer. These dried mango slices from supplier number one have a sugar content of approximately 66% and most of this is natural. Remember that the fresh mangoes have a reasonably high sugar content and when you remove the moisture, the percent sugar on a weight basis increases as the moisture is removed. A dusting of sugar adds to the sweetness and prevents them from sticking together. So in this case, the mangoes from supplier number two have a dusting of sugar which increases the sugar content to 69%, but again, most of this is natural. In summary, there are numerous types of dryers and dryer designs available for a wide variety of applications. You should consult with dryer manufacturers for the type that best suits your needs. If possible, you should conduct several test runs on a small-scale dryer that the manufacturer may have available before you make your final choice. Do not underestimate the complexity of the drying process. As we shall see later, drying kinetics are extremely important in dryer design. Remember to build in additional water removal capacity for future increases in production. The water removal capacity of a dryer is difficult to increase after it is built. Thank you very much.